Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading stories from prison. Now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. So I started seeing my boyfriend over a year ago. When we first met, he told me about an ex-girlfriend and yada yada. The usual of most people's past. It wasn't until about two months in, he told me he had kind of a weird event happen to him. Back in 2013-2014, he had his not-like-the-other-guys Tumblr blog and was followed by a girl from about three hours south of where we live. They ended up talking for a very long time both the same age and in high school. They confided in each other about everything. He claims he never crushed on her, but she definitely sent questionable material and obviously liked him. Anywho, his high school girlfriend at the time finds his Tumblr, ah, high school turmoil, and demands that he never speak to the girl again. Fast forward to 2018, and we are away at college. His mom contacts him and lets him know there's a letter in the mail from a different county jail. Name on the letter? The girl from Tumblr. Only way we think that she found his mother's home address is because she googled his mother's name, which popped up his childhood home residence. The letter was some rant regarding her love for him, and after her time served, would love to meet. For him, this was a very confusing call from his mom telling him the contents of the letter since he didn't want to drive to his hometown for a simple letter. Locked up? For what? He googled her name, and she's now in prison for seven years because of a felony hit and run, under the influence at 17, when she hit a young, college-aged male, got out of the car and checked on him and her car, and drove off. The poor kid sadly passed away, aka added vehicular manslaughter. Her sister had tried reaching out to him on Facebook, and he has had to block her. She messaged him, stating she was just given his name, and that the girl from Tumblr who is locked up wants to talk to him. He had completely forgotten about this girl, and she has not forgotten about him. I think it's funny that she somehow found his address. However, part of me questions if she will randomly show up at his door in 2025. He ultimately decided that he doesn't want to meet her even in seven years. Back in the 60s, my dad worked as a guard at a prison near Miami. He described his most memorable experience to me recently. He says that there was one prisoner who was a lot like a younger Hannibal Lecter. Very calm, but very menacing. He always kept cool no matter what, but there was something threatening about him. Well, one day, young Lecter was able to start a riot on his cell block, purely by motivating the other prisoners into a frenzy. He didn't participate in the riot at all but he got every other prisoner to start a fit in their cell. My dad and a few other guards were called down to the cell block to quiet them all down. He says that when he got down there, every prisoner was screaming and throwing themselves against the walls of their cells and shouting profanity and insults to the guards. That is, every prisoner except Lecter. He was the only quiet one on the whole block. My dad came up close to his cell and this guy was standing near the back with his hands folded, staring my dad directly in the eye, and muttering a random sequence of numbers with a strange smile on his face. My dad stood there, trying to figure out what the numbers meant, and then it finally hit him. The prisoner was reciting my dad's home phone number on repeat. In 
In the 1980s, my aunt used to volunteer at a prison teaching inmates how to read. She was an elementary school teacher and cared a lot about education. She did this for a long time until one of the prisoners became infatuated with her. It started out small by complimenting her. Then he began to tell her how in love with her he was and how he was planning a life for them outside of prison. My aunt told the guards all of this and they suggested she stop volunteering at the prison. On occasion, she would get phone calls from the prison and love letters. She would not accept his calls and didn't return his letters either. She went about her life ignoring him because he was behind bars and couldn't hurt her until he escaped from prison. My aunt was out of town and got a call that he had escaped. She called the local police immediately and asked them to check her house with her when she returned home. My aunt lives alone in a ranch style house, so the police surveyed the house the basement and the main floor and found nothing. Her home security system was intact as well. She had a friend stay over that night and everything seemed okay. Around 1 a.m. they heard scratching noises and called the police. They thought the noises were coming from her mother's empty bedroom. The police searched the outside of the house and the bedroom and found nothing. Around 2.30 they heard scratching noises again and also the sound of footsteps. The police then checked the attic, which was more like a crawl space that my aunt used for storage. They found the prisoner crouched behind a box with a screwdriver, hacksaw blade, and two blades from a pair of hedge cutters. He got into the house by slitting a window screen that gave him access to the attic. He is still in prison, and will be until he dies. I've told this story to a few of my friends, and they've asked a lot of questions, so I'll try to answer some of the frequent ones. He knew where she lived because it was the 80s, and people's addresses were in phone books. Apparently, he just wandered off the prison farm and hitchhiked to my town. I don't know who would pick up a prisoner, but it happened. The attic window is tiny. I don't know why the police didn't check on their first two sweeps, but I think they just ruled it as impossible for anyone to get into it. The screen didn't look slit when they did their outside scan. Their first scan was also at 11 p.m. My aunt still lives in that house. She loves her home. And she's a pretty tough woman if you haven't gathered that already. Very independent. I hate to say, I have another story to tell. You'll notice it's been a while since this happened, but for legal reasons I was not allowed to talk publicly about it due to the severity of the event. But, I have been granted permission to speak publicly about it. There's no news story about it, at least not yet anyways. It'll all make sense. If the formatting is off, I'm sorry, I'm on my cell phone, and I'm copying and pasting this story. Here it goes. This is going to be a long one, just FYI. I'm a 21-year-old male. It was July 4th, 2019. I live in Kansas in the USA. At the time, I worked as a corrections officer at a maximum security prison on the night shift. The cell house I was in charge of was the maximum general population. One man to a cell. This is where murderers, R-wordists, and overall the worst of society were housed. Before work... I was doing the typical American 4th of July thing, grilling, blowing up fireworks, had a beer or two, having a great time with my now wife and family. My wife kept telling me I needed to just call in sick and take the day without pay. I said no because we were behind on bills. I really wish I had listened to her now. As the night went on, it came time for us to leave my mom's and for me to go home and get ready for work. I took my wife home and dropped her off, got ready, and left for work. My wife's car was broke down, so she was stuck at home for the night. As I drove to work, which was about an hour away, I watched the fireworks going off all around. It was sad. I had never had to work on the 4th before. After I got to work and got all my equipment, I got into my cell house. Business as usual. Inmates were showered and locked up. I got my night cleaning crew out so they could clean the rest of the cell house and met up with my partner for the night in the officer station to get our briefing from the last shift. Fast forward an hour into my shift. 
So it's now right around 1230 a.m. Another officer came into the cell house, so now there's three of us. This happened often on night shift, as there was nothing to do except rounds every half hour or so. Out of nowhere, we hear an inmate laughing like a witch. Like a cackle. That was strange, but nothing to be alarmed with. Drugs were a bad problem in that facility. Still is, as far as I know. Eventually, after a few more cackles, I decided to go see who was making that sound, just in case they were high. I walked through and checked all 200 inmates. Nothing. There were a small few that were even awake, so I brushed it off and just went back to my office. My partner and the other officer were asking if there was anyone that needed their cells searched. I couldn't think of anyone in particular. I suspected of having anything. So I went and checked all the cells again to see if I could get a whiff of smoke or see something. As I was walking on the second story cell run, I found an inmate that was acting weird. He was in his bed facing the wall. Talking. This was also common as there were a lot of inmates with minor mental issues. I figured he was high because he turned and looked at me and told me to F off. I was going to leave him alone. But the disrespect made me change my mind. Time is now 12.40 a.m., July 5th. I walked back to the office and tell the other two officers which cell he was in, and I wanted him searched. Cell 218. So how the cell house is laid out, there are 100 cells per level. From the officer's station, you can see the north side, first and second floor, but you can't see the south side unless you walk 50 feet over to it. Picture the movie Shawshank Redemption type cell house, except... Instead of being able to look through and see cells across, you just see a wall. The cells are literally back to back. As the officers go to pull him out of his cell to search it, I went to the ground floor and was watching from below. Reason why, I wanted to get the inmate on the ground level and not the second floor. All that was there for protection from going over the edge was a handrail. I noticed the inmate was taking forever to get out of his cell. He came out in shorts and a do-rag, which is weird because he wasn't fully clothed didn't even put sandals on, just shorts and a do-rag, yet took five minutes to get out. That made me nervous. The inmate was a six-foot-tall, 250-pound muscle-bound dude. Definitely had size on us. So from the ground, I holler at him and tell him to come down to the ground and that he could use the phone or check his email or commissary. He declined my offer, which never happens. I knew something was up. He was watching them search his cell from the control panel box. This was alarming. They were in his cell. I was on the ground. He could have easily ambushed them. He would have made it to them before I could get up the stairs. So to try to keep them safe, I went upstairs to the inmate. He was standing in the corner away against the handrails at the top of the stairs. He knew I was the OIC, officer in charge, of that cell house. And he knew that I was the one that saw him talking to himself. He asked me why I was having his cell searched. I lied. I said, It's nothing personal, man. I have a quota to fill for cells searched at a night, and you were awake, so I chose you to have it searched. It'll just take a second. He was uneasy. He was pacing. Something was not right. Then I saw it. He had turned just right, and I saw his do-rag, the Samsung logo reflecting the cell house light. Crap. I knew there was going to be a problem as soon as I saw it. He had a cell phone. I called over the radio for two additional officers to come to me. The inmate didn't seem to notice I made the call. My supervisors responded saying two of them were on their way. Side note. At this time, only segregation officers had protective vests. So out of the five of us that were now in there, only one had a vest. I was not that one. The officers were South, McCormick, Collins, Sheffield, and me. Time is now 12.58 a.m. As soon as South and McCormick got up to me, I got the inmate to turn around and cuff up. South and McCormick were on the inmate's right side. I was in front of him. Why? He angrily asked me. I refused to give him a reason at first. After a few minutes, I had enough. I told him, Look, man, I can see the cell phone in your do-rag. You know you're not supposed to have that. The inmate then gets a defeated look on his face, but fire in his eyes. His body relaxes and he slowly reaches up to retrieve the phone. But does he pull out a phone? Nope. 
He pulls out a six-inch sharpened metal rod with ripped fabric wrapped around the bottom as a handle. Everything froze for me. I knew I was going to die. Everything starts moving again. I now have an inmate twice my size charging me, thrusting quickly and repeatedly towards me. Oh crap, was all I managed to yell. I immediately went into defensive mode, trying to grab his arm and disarm him. His wrist kept slipping. I couldn't keep hold of it, but at least I managed to block his attempts at my lower abdomen. Suddenly he aimed high and went for my chest. I felt it make contact. I had just been stabbed in the right part of my chest. Spray him, I yelled at the top of my lungs. McCormick was already working on spraying the MK9 OC spray. For my military readers, you know what I mean. For others, MK9 comes as a pressured spray bottle about 20 fluid ounces. You can buy it at camping stores in the USA. It's called bear spray. It's the stuff that you spray bears in the eyes so that you can get away. South had come up behind the inmate and grabbed him around his chest and pulled him backwards right as McCormick sprayed. I didn't realize it at the time, but the spray hit me. The inmate and South as well as everyone near us. I was able to turn and run. I ran around the stair railing, past the panel box, and out onto the run of cells on the second story. I ran past a few cells, and turned around to see that he wasn't chasing me, but South was wrestling to the ground while gagging on the OC, as was I and McCormick. Sheffield, having heard the commotion, came running out of the cell, saw what was happening, and ran in to help. The inmate grabbed South by the vest and tried to throw him over the end of the landing, but South dropped to his knees before he went over. I grabbed my shoulder mic and screamed into it. Level a response to Charlie 2, now. Dispatch said something back, but I didn't hear it. I started to charge back to help save South. Before I could get away from the cell that I was in front of, Collins grabbed me from behind and told me not to go. Due to the layout of the runs, I didn't see it, but Sheffield grabbed the inmate from behind and body slammed him on his face and began cuffing him. Sheffield got covered in OC as well due to the inmates being covered in it. As soon as Collins let me go, I stood still and watched. Up the stairs came four more officers, the captain and a lieutenant. The lieutenant came and asked me what happened. I started to explain, but he cut me off after he saw the blood coming out of my left arm. After taking me out of the cell house, he made me lift my shirt because he saw the blood. He examined all my wounds. He had me remove all my equipment and hold paper towels to my arm. I was rushed to the ER. I was able to grab my phone out of my rental car. I had totaled my own car a few weeks prior by hitting a deer. I called my wife and told her what happened. She called my parents and siblings. Luckily, my injuries weren't too bad. I was stabbed four times. Once on my left arm, just below the elbow. That was through and through. Blade went in one side and out the other. Twice in the top of my left hand and the one that hit my chest went in the skin and hit one of the ribs keeping it out of my lungs. Out of 37 plunges, I think it's safe to say I'm lucky to be here writing this story. I didn't sleep for two days following the event. I still have nightmares almost daily. I'm always paranoid. I openly carry a gun now. After my attack, I was forced to resign for safety reasons. Everyone statewide that works in mask prisons now has vest. None of the people from there talk to me anymore. I feel abandoned. I have one guy from the facility that I still see. My sergeant who wasn't there that night. Court is coming soon to add three more attempted murders on the guy. Turns out he was a shot caller for the Crips gang. If you readers would like to see the wounds, let me know in the comments. It's from the day after the attack, after they had been scabbed up. I'll post them, except for the one on my chest. Stay safe, everyone. If any law enforcement guys read this, watch your six. Never be afraid to have backup. And to that guy that stabbed me, I hope for your sake that we never meet again. Aside from court. Because I have a hollow point with your name scratched into it. I am a female corrections officer in a state with a relatively high number of death row inmates. However, few executions are actually carried out. 
I used to work for a large county, but I work for a different agency now. This county was my first CO job years ago, and before that, I used to work retail and customer service while studying criminal justice. So I was really green. I used to be very liberal. I'm still liberal about a lot of things, but the job does change your perspective for most people. One thing that I used to believe very strongly was that no human being could be truly evil. This particular county jail is one of the oldest in the country, so parts of it have a totally linear layout. What I mean is that you have a long stretch of corridor with cells on either side, and the COs have to walk up and down to supervise the inmates. I'm actually giving enough information for anyone with good Google Foo skills to figure out a lot. As you can imagine, these linear layouts are not in style anymore because you cannot see every cell at the same time, but every inmate can see you. I have to say that units like this are extremely creepy too. I'm going to call this corridor the condos. We did not call it that, but I do not want to share the exact term which is specific to this jail. Less than 10 years ago, a quadruple stabbing homicide happened not far from where I grew up. The murderer, Michaels, described it as a butchering and he killed his former girlfriend, her family, and their neighbor, because he came over when he heard the screams. When the police found Michael soaked in blood and asked him what had happened, he said, It's obvious. I just killed everyone. The cops said that he seemed completely emotionless when he said it. At the time, I had only been a CO for about four months, and our facility received him as a pre-trial detainee. Now, obviously, he wasn't our first or only murderer, but the nature of the crime... Stabbings indicate a more dangerous personality than a shooter, for one thing, and his lack of remorse was horrifying. He was considered a volatile inmate, so we placed him in an observation cell in the middle of the condos where a CEO could always keep an eye on him. He would stand at his glass door in silence most of the day, just watching everyone. I swear, he only really spoke when he had visits. He actually had a full visits list of these big goth girls who would come in and swear they were in love with him. One day, I was working as a utilities officer, basically a floater who relieves people for breaks and helps out as needed. At this jail, utilities officers also got away with a ton of downtime and BSing. I was hanging out at one end of the condos where you would look down and see a lot of the jail, talking to another officer on duty. As they say, there are no secrets in jail. Plus, I was aware that there were points throughout the jail where you could hear very well into neighboring cells, that sort of thing. We were being pretty quiet, though. Plus, we stood a good 50 yards from Michael's observation cell. Also, you have to imagine, it would be difficult to stand in an observation cell and press your face against the glass to see people standing at a right angle so far from you. I was telling the other CO a funny story about my weekend which I wouldn't do out on a correctional unit nowadays, but we weren't getting into anything personal either. It was a long story involving my fiance at the time. I wrapped up talking to this CO because I had to get to the gate to relieve another officer for chow, and I had to pass Michael's cell. I didn't like walking past it because he stood there and stared at you, and back then I wasn't so good at hiding my nervousness. He always had his head slightly tilted down, so you could see the white under the irises of his eyes. Again, rarely saying a word. But today was different. I took one step past his door, and I heard him say, Edgecombe, in a barely audible whisper. I didn't even know he knew my name. Yes, our last names are on our uniforms, but I was never his primary officer, and we'd never interacted. It caught me off guard, so instead of ignoring it, it stopped me in my tracks, and I backpedaled to the door. He pointed to his mouth, and I leaned in to listen. His eyes looked so dark. I remember I felt hypnotized. He proceeded to recite word for word the story I had just quietly told the other officer at the end of the condos less than two minutes before, even copying the sound of my voice down to an audible lisp. This seemed to go on forever. I felt like we were the only two there. No 22 millimeters of glass protecting me. Just a five foot tall female and a murderer. I remember thinking for the first time of another human being. This evil and unfixable. Finally, I said, Sir, did you need something? He started to laugh hysterically and I walked away. 
I've been assaulted by other inmates. I've had stuff thrown in my eyes. People play mind games with me constantly. I've met some damn good lip readers too, but this was like something else. Now I work at a maximum security institution where I babysit all R wordists and murderers and pedophiles. I don't know how to make it make sense to you that this was the only time in my life where I felt inside of me like I was dealing with something not human. Michaels is in another institution now. He's on death row. He refuses to appeal. He made it clear to the press that this decision is not out of remorse. He has none. He just doesn't give a crap. And it is most logical in his mind for him to die. I tell this story to a lot of people because of how bizarre it is. Here's some background. This took place in 2007. I know that because I was in fourth grade and I was nine at the time. We live in a large neighborhood and at that time it was surrounded by farmland. My house is a one story house. When you stand in the doorway of my room, you can see the front door, the kitchen on the left, my brother's room straight ahead. Turning your head to the left, you can see the living room and my parents' room. You can get from my parents' room to the front door in less than a minute. For a while, we had been getting calls from jail. We had a home phone and had a caller ID. Three times a day for a week, our phone would call and the caller ID would say jail. We had no relation to jail at all. No police came to the house, nothing. We never answered. My mom always said that if they don't leave a voicemail, then it's not important. They never left once, so we didn't answer. They always seemed to call in the morning, afternoon, and evening. Well, one day, we only got one call. We thought that was weird, but didn't care. That night, I was in my bed playing quietly because my sister, she was an infant at the time, was sleeping in my room. I remember playing with my Madeline doll, and I decided to go to bed. It was around 9 or 10 p.m. at the time. When I put my head on the pillow, the doorbell rang. Well, this was the time my dad would be getting home, so I thought it was my dad playing with me. The doorbell rang again and again and again. I got scared, clutched my doll, and ran into my mom's room. She was awake and watching TV. I told her someone was ringing the doorbell. She paused the TV and the doorbell rang. Just kept ringing. She immediately got my brother and sister the ringing stopped. She looked through the peephole and saw a black figure of some sorts but couldn't make it out. She did mention that she didn't know if it was a person or something else. She was too afraid to turn the porch light on. She went back to her room and the ringing continued and then knocking. It didn't sound like someone was trying to break in. It sounded like casual ringing and knocking, but it just kept going. Then it went faster and more intense. I got scared and cried. Mommy, Make it stop. Make it stop. My mom called my dad to get home now. He was 30 minutes away, and we endured intense ringing and knocking for what seemed like an eternity. The longer we waited, the more vicious it sounded. Then it stopped. We sat in silence with the only light being the TV. Then the garage opened. My mom had this sense of fear in her eyes as the garage went up. She held my infant sister tightly, braced herself to protect us. And it was my dad. Tell me when you arrived. My dad didn't see anything. His lights were on when he pulled into our street, but he drove slowly. He saw no car driving past him or anyone. My brother and I started to head back to our rooms when the ringing started. We froze. The ringing and knocking continued viciously, and my dad ran towards the front and swung it open. No one was there. Nothing. My dad ran around the house. Nothing. The calls from the jail stopped. We keep our porch light on now. And whenever the doorbell rings, I do get nervous and keep quiet. I am afraid that one day, it might happen again. Edit. We built our house and we still live in it. So it's impossible that someone could have lived there. 
We also never called the police because my mom thought that they wouldn't take us seriously over someone ringing the doorbell and knocking on our door. We installed a ring doorbell a year ago, and I don't really have a fear of the doorbell ringing anymore. Let me preface this by saying that I'm a correctional officer. I'm female and about five foot three. I've worked in a large county jail for going on 13 years now. And in my time there, I've had some harrowing experiences and met some extremely creepy and violent individuals. However, of all the strange situations I've been in, there's one that I find especially disturbing in retrospect. I was 20 at the time and barely off of probation. I was young and stupid and didn't have the experience needed to truly understand how dangerous my job was at that point. I was working the night shift, 10.30 p.m. to 7 a.m., locked in a room with dozens of inmates and nothing but a handheld radio to protect me. The pod I was assigned to housed 72 inmates. State law says that you're supposed to have one officer for 48 inmates. In actuality, we have two pods side by side with 72 inmates each. There's one officer assigned to each pod and a third officer who's supposed to float back and forth between the two housing units. This third officer is hardly ever present until lunchtime. They're inevitably assigned to some other random detail in the facility, escorting inmates, supervising trustees, etc. Now you might assume that jails are divided by types of criminal, i.e. misdemeanors housed separately from felons, but this is only the case after someone goes to court and gets convicted. Most people in county are still awaiting trial, so they're all mixed up together. The guy with unpaid parking tickets might be cellmates with a murderer. You never know. So you never really know who you're dealing with until you look them up. To paint a picture of the environment, the pod itself is a lot like a college dorm. There's a large central day room with two tiers of individual rooms circling the perimeter. There's a stairway on either side of the pod leading to the second tier. Right beside one stairway is the bathroom slash shower area. Now this is what we call a direct inmate supervision setup. So the officer is locked in the pod with the inmates. Theoretically, your sister pod next door should be keeping an eye on you. There's a glass wall between the two pods. But in reality, they usually don't have time to remember you exist. Back in the day, we locked all the inmates into their cells every night at midnight, and they stayed in until breakfast time around 4 a.m. On the day this occurred, I was assigned to a floor that housed male inmates. We have both males and females in the facility. My relief officer, Officer Smith, was out and about on some other assignments, so I was alone at midnight. I told all the inmates to rack down, and they scattered off in different directions to their cells. When the day room appeared to be empty, I stood up to go do a security check, i.e. check all the doors and make sure they were locked. I started on the far side of the pod away from the bathroom area and walked upstairs. I went around the catwalk making sure each cell door was properly secured. My sister pod was undoubtedly doing the same. The day room appeared deserted as I made my way past the cells. I circled the catwalk, happy for the peace and quiet that I knew I'd be getting for the next few hours. I was walking along, oblivious, not paying any attention to anything other than the doors I was checking. I approached the head of the steps and began to take a step down. As my foot hit the top step, I heard a loud pounding on the door. Boom. 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 Startled, I snapped to attention and looked out over the catwalk to the door. Officer Smith was standing there and he was pointing dramatically to the foot of the stairs. I heard him yelling but couldn't make out what he's saying. At that time, I see someone dart out from behind the stairs, butt naked and running across the day room. Apparently, a large, well-muscled inmate had been hiding behind the shower curtain while I did my rounds, and had crept out to wait beneath the stairs, and I assume ambushed me as I came down them. The inmate played it off as a prank, and nothing was done to him. I was good and scared, and to this day, I still keep a close watch on my stairways when I'm doing rounds. Maybe he was just planning to scare me, but I'll never know. If Officer Smith hadn't returned at just the right minute, there's no telling what might have happened to me. This incident shook me, and really made me take my job more seriously. I've had tons of interesting experiences since then, 
I've spoken with serial killers, hitmen, necrophiliacs, high profile criminals, been in tons of fights, had boiling water thrown on me, dealt with crazy people of every type. But this incident really stands out for me, and I share it with every rookie I get a chance to. The heightened awareness I gained from this incident may have saved my life many times over. In my town, there used to be an abandoned prison. It has since been knocked down. It was in the middle of the woods, and it wasn't the kind of place you'd just end up at accidentally. Every once in a while, police would patrol it. But for the most part, they just let the barbed wire fences do their job. Now, this wasn't a high-security prison for serial killers or anything, but it held robbers and R-wordists and the like up until about eight years prior to the incident. It was unsettling during the daytime especially as so much of it had been left behind, as if the place was abandoned in a hurry, but it was downright creepy at night. Well, in high school, my friend and Nick and I loved exploring it. We went all over, including to the abandoned mental hospital that was only a couple of miles from the jail. We were lucky. Growing up in the area, we knew that there was a small hole under the fence in one area, which was the only way to access the jail. One night, we made the normal trip under this hole, and were walking around the area outside the jail. We were moving as quietly as we could. As I said before, occasionally police will troll the area. They just parked their cars at the opposite side of the fence from where we entered, so we wouldn't be able to see them if they were there. Eventually, we were pretty sure that there were no police, so we began to be a little louder and turned on our flashlights. I should mention now that, other than the occasional policeman who parks his car outside the fence, we had never seen another person anywhere near the jail, let alone inside of the fenced area. We were hesitant to enter the jail itself, first of all because of how scary it is at night, and second because it's a pain in the butt to get into the jail itself during the daytime, let alone at night. So instead, we kind of just walked around the outside for a while as we normally do, scaring ourselves for the fun of it. Anyway. Eventually, we start to work up the courage to go inside of the jail, so we make the long trip to the other side of it where we knew one entrance was. We're walking along the side of the jail where the cells were, which had these huge windows. These were so that from the outside, when the jail was in use, you could see all of the inmates and what they were doing. As we're walking, out of nowhere, a light turns on from inside of the cells that we were only a few feet away from. We couldn't really see anything inside. Just the one beam of flashlight which first points upwards, then turns directly at us. At first, we just froze in terror. As I said before, we'd never seen anyone in there before. Who would be sitting inside of a cell, totally silent and in darkness as a couple of teenage boys walked by outside? We couldn't imagine that it was a fellow thrill seeker like us. It was not the kind of place you'd sit alone in the dark in. A homeless person? No. We didn't think he'd have a flashlight, and anyway, we assumed the cops must look through the inside during the day every once in a while. A police officer? No. There was no reason he would be sitting inside of the building, waiting while he would have known we were there for a long time. After a few seconds, we sprinted away as fast as we could. I didn't even turn around to see if we were followed or anything. We just found the hole under the fence and got out of there. So we wondered to this day... Who was sitting inside of an abandoned jail cell in the dark, presumably watching two teenage boys walk around outside, then waiting until they were only feet away to announce his presence by turning on a flashlight? I'd assume we'll never know the answer to that question, and I don't really want to know. We never went back at night, and the place is gone now. I can provide pictures if anyone wants them. In Tennessee prisons, non-affiliated guys are called peons. 
If you were a peon and in the cell with an affiliated guy, then you were responsible to take all of the cell write-ups. That's just one reason why you should not sell with an affiliated individual. For those who are not aware, a peon is a non-affiliated individual, which means they're not in a gang. If you were affiliated, you always had a peon hold your tool slash wrench slash butcher knife when you were in for count or on lockdowns. It was violation to have it in the cell when it was locked down. This keeps you from getting caught in a humbug. I've never been affiliated and was not going to become affiliated while in prison. The way I see it, if you're not in a gang when you went in, then you don't belong to a gang. And when you did do that, you showed you had no balls. And the gangs knew this as well. So if you go into prison, do not believe that joining a gang is going to protect you. No, you gotta have the balls to stand up for yourself. And do not ever show any sign of weakness. Gang members are not stupid. Most of the real affiliated guys have been doing it their whole lives. It was and is just the way of life for them. Most are very intelligent, and being in a gang on the street was just the way to protect their block. Then you get these country boys who come in and have watched way too much TV. Add insecurity and the feeling of wanting to be a part of something to the mix, and next thing you know, they're trying to join a gang. They're the sendouts. So if you go to prison, don't try to join a gang, and do not sell with a gang member. Don't get me wrong. It's not like they're going to do anything bad to you. Well, some may test you, but the main reason is, if they shake the cell down and find anything, you're going to take the charge for it. Now, if you're flattening, and you do not have much time to do it, then it can be a real hustle. Taking the charge for contraband, cell phone, or butcher knives brings in some good money. They're going to pay you to take the charge. It's not like they're going to force it on you, and not give you something, unless you're a chump or a coward then they are going to take full advantage of you. Just a little thought I had on my mind and would love to share it. Those of you who have been in know exactly what I'm talking about. So leave your comments below and let me know what it's like in your state. I'm talking about Tennessee and sometimes Alabama. Picture a fishbowl, not an aquarium, a cheap, oval, small glass fishbowl. Now imagine that this fishbowl is built to house four to five fish. With four to five fish inhabiting the bowl, they would all have room to mind their own business and breathe easily. Now picture the pet owner gets super excited at having fish. The fish not only make him feel important, the fish somehow actually create a recurring home. The pet owner returns from the pet store one day after acquiring a full bucket of brand new fish. He's diversified his collection as well. His new acquisitions range from freshwater to saltwater fish, goldfish to the prick beta fish, and fish too pretty to be confined. Lifting his bucket over the fish bowl, he pours all the water and new fish into the bowl meant for four to five fish. They tumble chaotically, the pouring water driving them into their new home. Most of the fish are driven to the bottom of the bowl. However, a few perish as the overflow of the bowl carries them to their demise. The water stops. The fish, dazed, start to slowly swim. There's not enough room, however, and resentment builds. The pet owner gleefully watches his pets, telling himself he's doing the fish a favor. Nobody else wanted them. He's doing the world a favor. He turns away disinterested almost immediately and moves on to a new project he'll check in on the fish in a year or two discuss taking measures to make their bowl cleaner or put them back where they belong but no actions will be taken the fish will find others like them goldfish with goldfish beta with beta all of them seek their own but there's still not enough room what happens when 30 fish occupy a space made for four to five fish they eat each other. This is a metaphor for the penal system of America.
the guy who sex trafficked me is in prison, but is still on Facebook daily. He's in a gang. That's the only way that I know to simply put it. I found out him and another guy in another prison, both involved in what amounts to sex trafficking, amongst other things. I was told by someone they have spread so many rumors about me and do it all from prison. My life is hell. How do I handle this? Gangs run the prison guards a lot, even in local jails. I can report it, but would it really do anything? They probably just want me to off myself. But what do I do? My friend's uncle was a cellmate with the notorious serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. According to my friend's uncle, Jeffrey Dahmer was a soft-spoken and nice man. He even gave words of wisdom, like how to get ahead in life. Decapitation was the only way. My friend got a couple of years for nonviolent drug charges. He's a pretty reserved and sweet guy. On his first or second day, the guards brought a guy into Gen Pop, told everyone this guy threw his infant against a wall, and then just left. My friend said witnessing the beating that followed was one of the most traumatic moments of his entire life. I guess they beat him within an inch of his life. When I was in prison, I witnessed a riot where a man was beaten to a mess of flesh, doused in hot oil, then set on fire only to die a horrible death. Then the inmate in the nearby cells died from intoxication of the fumes, filling his cell and lungs. Never been to prison, but I was in county jail for a few days. Charges dropped with prejudice. It was a community holding area, meaning group sleeping arrangements with many bunk beds in one room. Being a quiet, invisible type person, I got on pretty well. I befriended a few by teaching them chess and playing them blindfolded and sharing my food. I didn't need anything for the week or so I was in. Anyway, after day three, a new guy came into our area. He was a short, buff, 20-something with a Napoleon complex. I avoided him as much as possible being a scrawny white guy with a hate-being-spanked complex. I was having some bad allergies at the time and sneezed incessantly. After every single sneeze, even during a series, Napoleon would say bless you and I would respond thank you. It got to the point of being a staccato of a chew. Bless you. Thank you. One time I started seizing and didn't say thank you after every blessing. The kid blew up and charged at me from across the room shouting obscenities and brandishing his fists. My friends from earlier sprang up from the adjacent wall and tackled him. They proceeded to pummel him until the guards broke up the fight. Napoleon was sent to isolation. Nobody pressed charges. I would like to thank everyone for watching this video. I appreciate each and every one of you immensely. Thank you so much. I can't even describe how thankful I am for everyone who watches 
everyone who likes, comments, and subscribes. I really appreciate each and every one of you. And I want to give a special shout out to our members. Thank you so much to Sherry Uchel, Zane Loggins, Martha APS, Hail Mary, Gingerbread, Carrie Morris, Crystal, Brown Doe, Jado, Sarah Rodriguez, Inner Scare Wifey, Chili, Snowing Wine Drops, Tina Mead, Taylor Ruist, Claire, Casey Brown, Caroline Hawksworth, Eric Donter, The Green Reaper's Nightmare, Simply Complicated, Tangela Young, Miss Cannabis, Anon Q, Mathematica, Christy Goodall, Skin Crawler, Taryn, Ruby, Jennifer Moyer, Classic Sonic the Hedgehog, Cappy Karma, Paul Reese, Via Mash K0101, and Honey Pond. I appreciate you all immensely. Thank you so much for watching, and have an excellent rest of your night. Good night, everybody.